Right. Let's just keep going on. Okay. okay. Very, this is very real, <laughs> folks. Just so you know, this is very live. So this is the audience. Hello, okay. Audience. Hi, audience. Okay. So <laughs> just like Matthew twenty-five forty, you know, for what you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you know, you do for me, and and it's so true. This is a human stories episode, and we have a special guest with David Sherin. He is a pastor and executive director of Street Life Ministries. Yes. So Street Life Ministries is a church on the street. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we have um, church without walls and we gather four nights a week, two nights in Redwood City, two nights in Menlo Park. And uh, we're at dinner. Uh, so we're a later night. We don't start till 7 p.m. Our population is those who live on the street. And so we work with people who are homeless, people who are living just below the margin that are having a hard time making ends meet. And um, for those who just don't feel comfortable being inside of a, like an institution type church. I see you very passionate in this ministry. Where that heart comes from? I was born and raised here in Redwood City. Um, I was, I'm, I'm adopted, I'm roughly a few months old when I was, when I was brought home to, to my mom and dad. The only thing was, is I started looking at my mom and dad like I don't have their ears, I don't have their eyes, I don't, I don't look like them. And so, I, at a very early age, I started feeling alone. Uh, somewhere between uh, the fourth and fifth grade, my my dad uh, started suffering a lot of injuries at work. He was a truck driver, worked really hard. So my dad became very addicted to Vicodins and started drinking and started smoking a lot of marijuana. wasn't raised well himself. And so he did, I don't think he realized what he was, what he got himself into. So what he did was, is he started uh, to call me stupid. You're an idiot. You know, and anything I did wasn't, wasn't good enough. You know, I idolized him. He was my, he was my hero. And as I got older, I started to believe what he said. So what happened was, is that started to portray into my school life around sixth to seventh grade. I started to drink the drinks on my parents' table. I remember the very first time that I got drunk and, and I was in my bedroom and I was laying on my bed and I had my foot on the floor trying to stop myself from spinning. I just remember loving that feeling. Around the sixth grade, um, I, I, I found my dad's magazines and he had porno magazines in the, in the, in the closet. A um, lot of cocaine, a lot of marijuana in the house. And I started stealing his drugs and I would just go to parties and I found out that these girls wanted the cocaine, these girls wanted the marijuana. So I started using that to get sex. I started using that to get friendship. I went from like a nobody to everybody wanted to hang out with me. You know, before I was even 21, I got married. I was cheating on her before my honeymoon was even over. You know, and that marriage didn't even last a year. I just went way off the deep end, started using a lot of drugs, drinking a lot of alcohol. I met another woman. I was actually selling uh, drugs at the time and, and I met her and we, we were partying and all that stuff and and uh, she got pregnant and so I thought I was gonna do the right thing I'm gonna get married so now I have a 20 year old daughter from that marriage unfortunately she and I have a very on again off again relationship I, I made a lot of courses of impulsive bad choices so I just loaded my car up one day and I just left I left her I left my, my daughter and I just came back to California and then here I am, you know, in my late 20s, trying to be in, in a world that I shouldn't be in. And, and again, it was all about wanting to be liked, wanting to be feared, wanting to be appreciated, wanting all this, this emptiness that I had. I got kicked out of the house I was living in. I moved in with several different women, you know, I started selling drugs. I started going to jail, started getting locked up a lot and, and uh, spending a lot of time in county jail. And towards the end, I was 35. I was completely strung out on meth. I was homeless. I never ever thought that I would eat food out of a garbage can. I, I would ask somebody for money. Getting to that point where I was either gonna take my own life or somebody was gonna shoot me or um, I was gonna overdose. I was faced with a, a judge and the judge uh, told me that I needed to go into some recovery or I was gonna uh, look at facing some jail time. I went into a program. There was this guy there that everybody loved. He was so happy. He smiled all the time. He never said anything negative about anybody. And that just bothered me. Like I, I, I couldn't see how anybody could be like that. Like why are, like I just, to me, somebody that is that happy and, and that positive at that time in my life, they had to be hiding something. Like they were fake, right? But I was faced with getting, with getting kicked out of this program. And so he was the only guy that came to my mind. And I told him what was going on. And I said, I need you to go downstairs and tell this guy to not kick me out. 
And I just remember him telling me really clearly that, that he wasn't gonna do it. And, but he knew one that would do it for me, and that was Jesus Christ. I looked at him and I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, really? I go, that's not, that's not gonna happen. And he said, he says, it's really simple. He says, just give me five minutes to just pray over you. And I thought in my mind at the time, I figured, okay, well, if I give him what he wants, then what he's gonna do is go, okay, good job. He's gonna pat me on the back and then he's gonna go talk to this guy and it's gonna be over with, you know? So, so what he ended up doing, he started praying over me. I started to, he's holding my hands and I just remember I just started sweating. I, I was shaking, I felt chills, I was really, really cold and then I was really, really hot again. And I just started crying and I just had, I mean, snot was coming out of my nose. Like, I mean, I was a hot mess as he's praying over me. Everything that I had done, all the lies that I had told, everything just starts like flooding out of me, you know, like a confession. And I was asking for forgiveness. And he says, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I could not stop saying yes. I remember that feeling that I had when I was a kid and I took that first drink and I thought I felt free. I felt free. But this time, without the nausea, without the dizzy, without anything, I felt free. And for the very first time in my entire life, I felt like I was connected to something. I didn't know what I was connected to and I, and I didn't know why I was feeling this freedom. But all I remember is feeling so much joy. And so I asked him, I go, you know, what, what just happened? Like, you know, what is that, you know? He says, what happened was is the Holy Spirit was coming within me and was dwelling in my in, inside me and that all the demonicness, all the doorways that I had that were open, all the sin that I had brought into my life was being purged out. And now I, I, I was a whole new creation. And so we leave his office and as we're walking out, the guy who was kicking me out of the program is coming up the stairs and he comes right to me and he puts his hand out and he says, hey, I just want to apologize for the way I talked to you. Um, I just want to let you know I'm not kicking you out of the program and I just hope you can forgive me. And the program helped me get into what's called an SLE. It's a sober living environment. I started going to a men's uh, Bible study. So that's where I met uh, uh, my sponsor walking me through the word and through the 12 steps and, the, and recovery together. So they helped me get a job and, and that I was working at Stanford University. I was working at Jamba Juice. The interesting thing is, is about a year into my sobriety, what happened was is I started realizing that a lot of my anger and my resentment towards my family was, was me and my way of escaping taking ownership and responsibility for my own actions. And so I got about uh, 14 months clean and sober. I was able to admit to my mom and dad all the things that I had done, all the things that I had stolen from them, all the lies that I had told, and, and all the things that they had done to me that made me hurt, and they confessed to me all the things that they had felt and the things that they had done and the things that they had said and and they asked for for an apology for the very first time um just i felt like uh, this family this is this is my family it was interesting i finally saw my dad for for a man who i love and i respect but i don't idolize him anymore he's not my hero anymore god's my hero I idolized Jesus. And it was really interesting when I was able to make that shift between who who I really idolize to who I respect and I admire. It was so much easier to focus on my dad as, as a human being and not, not an idol. I mean, I was really like, really going good. And I was driving for a company out of San Jose. It was around 2008 or so. Out of nowhere, the economy just completely collapsed. I lost my job. I kind of went into like a depression. So I went to my sponsor. All that that old behavior of blaming everybody else and blaming God for what was happening started to come out. He says, right down the street at the train station, there's a ministry down there that they feed a hot meal to people that live on the street. And he says, what I really want you to do is he goes, I want you to take your selfishness and your self-pity and your little soapbox and I want you to go down there and I want you to go serve people who have way less than you. That's what I did. So I put some rubber gloves on and I started serving some hot meal and you know, we're serving and we're serving and we're serving and then all of a sudden 
three guys that I used to do drugs with. And sure enough, Dave, you know, and uh, what are you doing? And why are you here? And how, what happened to you? And this and that. And so uh, I ended up telling them, you know, what had happened and what's going on with my life. And they kind of were like, yeah, I'd like to, you know, I want to change. You know, I want to get off the streets. And these guys were like serious. They wanted to get off the street. And so I wanted to get in there and start helping. I fell in love with this ministry. So I just really started praying to God, like, please, Lord, if this is, if this is your will, show me where you want me to go. I realized that 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 street church that had started through Tony Gapstone. You know, here we are a year later, and then Tony and Gary and Brian want to announce to the whole church that they're now going to release the ministry under my care. And and I don't know, but God is pretty amazing. Dan Dan filed the paperwork, and it seemed like within like mm -hmm. three weeks we were sitting with with the approval letter for a five one c three. And I had friends that had other nonprofits like, how'd you do that so fast? I go, it's all God. Well, we're. Seven years later, I haven't gone without a paycheck. I, you know, I changed all my tax status. It started uh, forming, uh, you know, all that. And we, I became an employee of, of Street Life Ministries. Five years ago, my dad passed away. And, and I'm really grateful that my dad and I were able to be best friends before he died. Like right when my dad died, um, Sean had stepped into my life. And we had just kind of started meeting each other. She was just kind of getting into recovery herself about a month or two sober we saw each other she she saw something in me and that i hadn't seen in her i wasn't really kind of focused on the relationship at the time i was just so busy with street church street church street church you know and uh, and then um about four or five months into her recovery we crossed each other's paths and i just i saw her and i was like wow she's so beautiful like wow look at that woman she's hot you know like and i'm like wow well, you know no no she's really new in recovery i gotta back off and we agreed that one year she has to have 12 months of sobriety before we can date. Well, one year turned into two years and she started to drift, I started to drift. And all of a sudden, the counselor that we were, we were meeting told me, she says, you've got to make a, a, a decision. She's in love with you. She wants to be with you. Either you, you got to get together with her and have coffee and tell her either it's over with or, or you, got to, you got to tell her that you want to be with her. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's like, that's so serious, right? So on her second year of sobriety, I asked her out. And so we went out, we had dinner, and then we went to a movie, and uh, we never stopped talking since. You know, so we got engaged, and uh, we got married at my mom's house. My mom lives on the coast. She has a house on, on a uh, ocean cliffs. I just love my mom, and I adore her, and it's been really cool. Dating my wife and realizing what a heart she has for the homeless, and working with women that have been sexually abused and physically abused. And God is cool, you know? He doesn't make mistakes. And he put me together with my soulmate. Not only do I get this, this beautiful wife, but I have this amazing son that I get to help her raise. And, you know, our son, he's never looked at me as Dave or David or my stepdad. He's accepted me as his dad. And... Um, and I'm honored by that because I have a second chance at being a, a, a good father and raising him right and raising him with security and safety. And I mean, we all serve in the ministry. Isaiah plays a part in the ministry because there's a lot of kids that show up. They fall in love with him and he, and he takes them on and plays with them. You know, we're four nights a week. We have 209 rotations a year that we, we're actually serving out on the street. Um, my wife and I and, and Bill and Bruce and all the pastors that are part of this ministry, uh, we do outreach in the community throughout the week outside of the ministry in recovery rooms in the campsites and the hospitals and jails. Uh, just like Matthew 25, uh, 40, you know, for what you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you know, you do for me. And, and it's so true. And that's how this ministry operates, you know. I just want to say, you know, the thing is too, is that there's no sin too great. There's no struggle too great. I never thought that I could get changed. I never thought that God would, would give me the life that I've got today. A, a home and a wife, a child. Um, I don't have any warrants for my arrest. I don't have to worry about going to jail anymore and no drug addiction. I'm free. You know, I have no compulsion to use, you know, um, healthy friends today. 
thank you so much Dave for thank sharing you. with us yes I think this is really great and for all you guys who have uh, struggling with your own life please don't hesitate to reach out everyone deserves a second chance if you want to contact us through the website it's just www.streetlifeministries.org you can go on our website and we have a, a number that you can call or you can just contact us on the website there's an info at streetlifeministries.org so we're mondays monday to through monday through thursday okay. four nights a week and the details will be on the website thank you so much guys for watching thank and you so much stay tuned for the upcoming human stories